Hey, Pastor Gary here for another Wednesday Word. So glad that you're able to just spend some time in God's Word. Uh, as you can see behind me, uh, we're the lady, the clothing pantry is getting ready for their distribution day, which is going to be this Saturday um, and at, here at the Spring Campus from 10 to 1 this Saturday, from 10 to 1 at the Spring Campus. Uh, know that there are going to be certain requirements as you come in. Uh, masks are mandatory. We also have hand sanitizer. Uh, and but also parents as you if you are planning to bring your children we do ask that you keep them in close proximity to you uh, don't let them wander we have a lot of space and a lot of items uh, but we really want uh, everybody to to abide by the social distancing and so if you are planning to bring your kids which is fine uh, just make sure that they're with you at all times and not to, and and don't let them wander. Uh, I'll take go ahead and take you on a on a quick tour if I can, um, and 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 let you see what um, what all is going on here. As you can see, uh, they have everything. They have the fellowship hall, of course, behind me. But they have all these racks of clothes. Uh, of course, there's the fellowship hall that's got clothes in it. They got toys for Christmas, and then it just it you could it just goes on and on. And so they are ready uh, to service and and, and service you and, and your needs. Uh, and so we do encourage you to come out and to share this ministry. It is an outreach opportunity for those in our community and all, our church community and also our neighborhood community just to come out and and just. Um, you know, get what you need. And so for more information, you can contact the church at uh, 281-350-9673. Go to our website, bfchurch.com. Uh, for any questions, please feel free to, you know, uh, contact us any of those ways, and we'll get in contact with you. Um, before we go any further, let's go ahead and, and pray. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. Father, at this time, Father, we do, Father, I just lift up our country to you, Father, lift up our leaders, Father. Father, you, you raise leaders, Father. Father, it, it's your will, Father, and we do pray for your will to be done, Father, in this, uh, in this election, Father. Father, we thank you for your grace again, Father. Father, I pray for uh, just that you give our leaders, Father, wisdom and discernment, Father, how best to lead this country, Father. Father, I pray for protection, Father. I just thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. And so today I want to uh, spend some time in Acts. And so go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And this is God's word. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, in this passage, we're told that those that followed Jesus were all together. The emphasis is not the emphasis is not only on the fact that they were in a particular place, but they, they met with a particular purpose. This verse is not only describing their physical location, but also their spiritual condition. There was in the fellowship of the early church a oneness. And the secret to that oneness was that they shared common commitments. It's those commitments that contributed to the unity of the body. Those commitments that Christians share with others who are truly committed in the desire to follow Christ. These commitments to, that contributed to the unity, unity of the early church were that there was a common commitment to the lordship of Christ. There was a common commitment to loving one another. And, that, and finally, there was a common commitment to reaching the lost. Let's look at that first one. It says there was, you know, it, it talks about how there was a common commitment to the lordship of Christ. See, the Bible tells us in Acts 1.15 that there were 120 who waited in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised. They waited for the Spirit, Holy Spirit's coming and spent time in prayer. Now, why did they wait? Because they were committed to doing whatever Jesus had told them to do. In Acts 1.8, it says that Jesus told them that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. But unfortunately, a lot like today, not everyone who, ha who has encountered or encountered uh, Jesus shared that commitment. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it's, it, it tells us that Jesus had appeared to over 500 people after, after his resurrection at one time, at, at one occurrence. So out of at least 500 people who had seen the risen Lord... There were only 120 who were committed to obeying his instructions to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit had come. 
When we as a church are focused on the lordship of Jesus, our focus is on something far more important than the things that can divide us. See, the secret to unity is a commitment to finding the answer to one question. And that question is, what does God want? That is the question that we must ask ourselves every day. We must always, we must always seek an answer to that question. What does God want? Regardless of what issues are going on in our lives or, or who has offended us, what does God want? See, there's, and, and secondly, there, there's a common commitment to loving one another. For those days that they were in the upper room in Jerusalem, 120 people remained together in that room. That's a long time to be in close, close quarters with people. See, it's these kind of conditions that can produce, can produce tension and frustration among people. I remember a couple years ago, uh, I, we, uh, my family, we went on vacation uh, to, to New York City, and so we rented an apartment. What well, we thought it was an apartment, it was a box, uh, but we rented an apartment. And so there was six or seven of us in a 800 square foot, I don't even know if it was 800 square feet, but it was a small apartment. And so we were there for f five or six days. And yeah, we got out, but it was just more people. And, and it, 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 there was a lot of tension. The first day was fun. The second day, fun. Third day, not so fun. Fourth day, somebody's not coming home. So it, it was, there was a lot of tension in, in, in those close quarters. But that wasn't the case with this. See, and, and why is that? It's because they realized that they were there. Uh, they realized that they were in this thing together, that they were committed to Jesus. They were committed to a common goal. See, in the book, One Church from the Fence, the author writes this. This is an excerpt from that book. It says, I have spent long hours in the intensive care waiting room, watching with anguished people, listening to urgent questions. Will my spouse make it? Will my child walk again? How do you live without your companion you know, of 30 years. The intensive care waiting room is different from any other place in the world. And the people who wait there are different. They can't do enough for each other. No one is rude. The distinction of race and class melt away. Each person pulls for everyone else. In the intensive care waiting room, the world changes. Vanity and pretense van uh, vanish. The universe is focused on the doctor's next report. If only it will show improvement. Everyone knows that loving someone else is what life is all about. So what makes the difference in the way people treat each other in the intensive care waiting room and anywhere else? It's that everyone realizes that they're all in the same boat. We too need to realize that we are all in the same boat. Without Christ, we are all in the intensive care waiting room. Without the Lord, we not, we, we not only can do nothing, we are nothing. We are all sinners, saved by God's grace. Having that perspective changes how we view each other. And it creates a willingness to love and forgive each other. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. And this is in the easy to read translation. It says, never be bitter, angry, or mad. Never shout angrily or say things to hurt others. Never do anything evil. Be kind and loving to each other. Forgive each other the same as God forgave you through Christ. See, in verse 31, in e so Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 31, we are told that there is never an occasion for us to be bitter, angry, or mad with one another. Never an occasion to shout angrily or to say things to hurt one another. Never an occasion to do evil to one another. And why is that? Because we are always in need of the Father's forgiveness provided through Christ. We must be willing to always express love for one another through forgiveness. So really, when I get angry or choose not to forgive others, I'm assuming that what they did to me is more serious than the sins that I've committed against God. But see, it's the, it's the cross that transforms that perspective. 
the cross makes me realize that no sin committed against me will ever be as serious as the sins that I've committed against God. Any that I have committed or any that I will commit against God. When we understand how much God has forgiven us, it's not difficult to forgive others. Because we are the most, because we are the most forgiving, forgiven people in the world, we need to be the most forgiving people in the world. We must live with an awareness of the need and the wonder of God's grace. Lastly, there's a common commitment to reach the lost. A common, that common commitment, there were 120 people waiting in that upper room while they prayed. Why do you think they were, what do you think they were praying about? They prayed about the task at hand, what they were charged to do once they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, right? This is the New Living Translation. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They prayed and they planned. They were consumed with the idea that it was their responsibility to reach a lost world with the good news of Jesus. They were unified in their mission to share the gospel to a hurting and lost world. Likewise, a committed Christian realizes that what matters most in church is not your personal preference. It's not your wants. But what will enable, it's what will enable us to get that gospel out to the lost. That's what's important. It's having the resolve to reach the lost. It's the glue that will, that is the glue that will always bind God's people together. There were only 120 disciples that were there in the upper room, ordinary men and women. They were told to go out and evangelize to the whole world. The Christian church began, had that small beginning. This, these, these disciples faced their task head on as we should. This may be the small beginning that allows you to spread God's word to the people that you come in contact with. You're through your work, through your, 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 your personal circle, your social circle, your, your work, your family. What's, what's your beginning? What's your commitment to share God's word with the lost? As a church, we must be unified in sharing the message of Jesus. In conclusion, unity in a church comes about because of a common commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is expressed by loving one another and reaching out to the lost. See, the committed Christian understands this. We, under, he underst we understand that we love God, love people, and reach the world. And the, the pantry and the distribution day is an example of, of loving God, loving people, and reaching the lost. It's about meeting people where they are, meeting those needs so that we can share Jesus with them. I ask that you, that you spend the next couple of days in prayer, prayer for those people that will come to this distribution day, that if they don't know Christ, that they will come to know him at, 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 at Believer's Fellowship at the Spring Campus Distribution Day. There will be members here from our hope ministry. There will be here people from the, the, the uh, clothing pantry that will be here and available to, to, to mentor, to pray, to disciple, to cry with, to pray with. We encourage you that if you have a need to call the church, to come by. And, and members, I ask that you again, that you just lift up the distribution day and pray uh, that God gets the glory in all of this. Well, hey, it's, it's been great being able to connect with you uh, via Facebook and YouTube through these devotional series. Uh, know that I'm praying for you. Uh, also, a couple of other announcements. Don't forget that we have uh, church on Sunday, two services, 9 o'clock at our Magnolia campus, 1045 at our spring campus. Um, again, Friday night, this coming up Friday night, will be our uh, members uh, members night for the distribution day and then saturday it's open to the public uh over at the magnolia campus they're having their men's bible study women's bible study so praying for y'all out there uh also the youth and uh, 
you know, just know that that we're praying for you, that you have a, a great uh, time of fellowship and just digging into God's word out there at Magnolia. Let's pray. Father God, Father God, we do pray, Father. We pray for, for our church body, Father. Father, that, that, Father, that we have that unity, Father, that we discussed, Father, that we are all focused on the Lordship of Jesus, Father, in our lives, Father. Father, that if we do have offenses towards somebody or, or somebody has offended us, Father, that we forgive them, Father, because you first forgave us, Father. And then, Father, you give us the conviction, Father, to share your word with people who don't know you, Father. Father, I thank you for the reminders, Father. Thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless. See you on Sunday.